Hey, good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to uh, Upper E for the invitation today. Um, wonderful conference, and it's wonderful to be able to get back together again after the hiatus of the last two or three years. Okay, just teeing up the slides here. Um, oops, sorry, let me get back one slide here. So when I was pulling together the, the presentation last week, I was uh, pulling the slides together, and I'd finished writing the, the few slides I have for, for a 10-minute keynote, and at the end of it, I, I needed a really catchy title, a really catchy title that would ensure that we'd have a, a good turnout for this event, and of course, we've got an incredible turnout. And I had that classic case of writer's block, and then on my, my bookcase, I saw a Time Magazine book that they put out a couple of years ago about the 100 greatest innovations of all time. So I pulled off the book from, from my cupboard, from my, my bookcase, and started to flick through. And there was the steam engine, there was penicillin, and the automobile, and uh, the Apollo missions. And then I started to think about climate change and the challenge that we're faced today. And in my opinion, this is, this is the greatest innovation challenge mankind has, has ever, ever met. The greatest innovation challenge mankind has ever met. And to be honest, it was, it was that realization a few, several months ago was that um, led me to change career. I had 30 years working in the oil and gas industry in the service sector, and I decided to move into climate tech because I felt as though I could really have a significant impact in both nurturing, developing, accelerating, and deploying technologies that can really have a significant impact here. So I think everybody in this room understands the urgency here, but for those who, who don't or may have not seen the, the, the deck from IPCC in the past, um, we have a real crisis ahead of us. Um, if we look at the, the rate or the increase in the surface temperature of the Earth in the last few years, it's been dramatic. And if we look at it compared to the pre-industrial era of the mid-1800s, uh, we're running at about a 1.2 degrees C increase over pre-industrial levels. And the, and the scientists at, uh, uh, at IPCC have basically said that, you know, we've got to try and maintain the temperature increase to below 1.5 degrees C to stave off the worst effects of climate change. That is really the target. And we're already at about 1.2, and we're at, an, at a significantly increasing, or exponentially increasing, um, period of, of warming that we're seeing today, and I think we're all seeing that today in, in the news. And it's interesting, when you start to look at where greenhouse gas, gas emissions come from, they come from various sectors. I know in, in the last 10 years or so, the oil and gas industry has certainly been in the crosshairs, I would say, but it's, been, it's many different industries that emit greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, whether that is in the, the steel industry, the cement industry, agriculture, or in just inefficient building operations, they all play a role in emitting significant quantities of greenhouse gases. But the good news is that the investment coming into climate tech has increased significantly in the last few years, a dramatic increase in, 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 in investment into climate tech. And in fact, even just, just this year, in the first quarter of this year, which is the, the right-hand bar on the chart here, there's almost 12 billion, with a B, billion dollars worth of investment has gone into climate technology. That is almost at the same le level as what was invested in the whole of 2021. So a very significant increase in, in investment into climate tech, that's, that's the good news. However, if you peel the onion a little bit to understand where that investment is going, the majority of that investment, about 60% of that invest investment in recent years, has gone into electric mobility into EVs. And this is great. I think we all are looking forward to the day when we can affordably drive electric vehicles. But that also means that, that investment into some of the very hard to, to, to abate sectors, like cement, steel, oil and gas, for instance, has not happened or hasn't happened at the same rate. And that poses a real challenge. So 
So let me, let me tell you a little bit about OGCI, because some of you may not have heard of OGCI before. So OGCI is the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, and it was actually started in 2015 by 12 of the largest oil and gas companies listed at the bottom of the screen here. And it's really to drive advocacy and policy change and best practice sharing to really start to change the industry quickly to address the challenge that climate, climate change is posing. Very quickly, within a couple of years, they, decided, they, they realized that to, to really accelerate progress, they needed to put their proverbial money where their mouth was and, and actually start to start an investment fund. So he started a fund which is approximately $1.1 billion, really to focus on, on decarbonization. And that is OGCI climate investments. Climate investments is actually quite different from many climate investment companies because climate investments is actually an impact investor. So you may say, what, what is an impact investor? Well, an impact investor means that when we start to look at potential investments, whether they're in specific projects or whether they are in, in venture uh, investments, then we look at impact first. So we look at what is the potential this company or this project can have in terms of decarbonizing, removing GHG emissions. That is our number one investment cri criterion that, that we look at. And so far we've got 26, 26 um, portfolio companies in, in, our, in our portfolio, and to date, have had an impact of greater than 25 megatons of CO2 equivalent emission abatement over the last three years. And to be honest, this appeal to me about joining climate investments, that it is, it is inherent to our mission and our purpose as an organization. This is how our performance is judged by our partner companies, the oil and gas companies, and ultimately it's how we're all compensated as well at the end of the day. So what is, our, what is our investment thesis? What is our impact thesis? I said before, we are focusing really on projects and venture investments that are really tackling some of the, the hardest to abate sectors, okay, the, the, difficult, the difficult to abate sectors. And there are three that we've, we've called out. One is all around reducing methane emissions. And I think everybody in the audience here understands that methane has a much higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide from anywhere from 25 to 80 times, depending upon the time base. So huge opportunity there, and there's some real low-hanging fruit here. If we can get the methane emissions where they need to be, it buys us time to tackle some of the more difficult uh, to abate sectors. The other area is reducing carbon dioxide emissions, and this is really an efficiency play, really focusing on improving the efficiency of energy systems. And then the third area is really around recycling, uh, and storing and reusing carbon dioxide, which is a real challenge, but there are some wonderful opportunities in that space as well. So really, really quickly, in terms of reducing methane emissions, there are many opportunities that we focus on. I'll give you a couple of examples. GHG Sat, they have two satellites, and they can measure methane emissions coming directly from assets um, on, on the Earth's surface. Similarly, Kairos and, and CCOPS have novel sensor technologies that are incorporated into drones, either fixed wing or, or the um, quad, quadcopter type, type drones that can really very precisely measure the rate of, uh, uh, rate of methane emissions and to localize exactly where these emissions are occurring. If we look at reducing CO2 emissions, I said this is really an efficiency play because out of all the energy that is produced to today, only 40% of that energy gets used in its intended purpose. The other 60% is actually wasted in terms of the overall supply of that energy. So a couple of companies I want to call out here. One is 75F. So 75F has a really uh, revolutionary platform, both a hardware and software platform, for optimizing commercial buildings' energy usage. Another company I want to call out is uh, Akates, Akates Power Systems. And they've developed a really novel engine system, a diesel engine system, which can also use hydrogen and ethanol, that has much greater combustion efficiency, reduces CO2 and NOx emissions and particulate matter dramatically. It's one of these opposed piston types of devices. And Akates is actually exhibiting at the conference uh, this week. So if you get a chance, uh, you may want to stop by their booth. 
And then the, the third and final area we wanted to just quickly touch on is the whole area of recycling carbon dioxide. We know carbon dioxide is a difficult molecule. It's at the bottom of the energy well. It's incredibly stable. So here we've really focused around projects, investing in projects. And our first one was actually net zero side over in the, the northeast of England, really focusing on being able to capture the emissions from, gas, from a gas-fired power plant capture them, transport, and store those emissions. We've sub subsequently invested in a number of other similar projects across the US that do exactly the same. In terms of, in terms of companies in this space, one company I'd like to call out is Econic. And Econic has developed a really novel catalytic process to be able to take CO2 and to efficiently convert that CO2 into polyols, into polyalcohols, which can then be used as starting materials in the petrochemicals process. So what I want to hope to have shared with you is just an example of some of the technologies that exist today. And there's some phenomenal technologies that do exist today. Now it's a case of deployment and scale to really have a significant, significant impact. And time is running out. And my last slide, just to wrap this up. So what, what does it really take to, to protect our planet? Because it is, this is a huge emergency that we're facing today. It's going to take a huge amount of additional capital. I showed you that the capital was increasing. That's not enough. The capital has got to come in, in addition to, to, to government funding, and it's wonderful to see what is actually going on from a government investment perspective as well. It's going to take a favorable government policy. It's going, to take, um, it's going to take a price on carbon, ultimately. It's going to take rigorous uh, regulations around methane emissions across all industrial sectors. It absolutely is. It's going to take, ultimately, a, a war footing to really be able to get after this at pace. However, I'm, I'm a realist and I'm, I'm an optimist. And working with, with innovators, and we've got some of the brightest minds in the world in the room today, I know we have the answers. We have the answers today. And you're all driving and embracing the challenge. But it's pace. We've got to really accelerate pace. And really here, it's all about this decade. This has got to be the decade of deployment. We've got to be able to deploy at scale some of these wonderful new technologies. And with that, I thank you all for your time. Carpe diem, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.